This Boris Effects webinar replay is brought to you by our technology partners, Dell, NVIDIA, and Intel. Hello. I'm going to be working today mainly in Avid Media Composer, and um, I'm beginning with a couple of clips on my timeline here. Um, just a couple of sh uh, short clips, and I'm going to start by adding from the effect palette, from the BCC 3D Objects group, I'm going to add Title Studio to the first event in my timeline. And that uh, initializes with the default text, which is just typing Boris effects in the in the default font. And I have a couple of options now. I can uh, go to the effects browser, or I can launch straight into Title Studio. What I'm going to do here is launch into Title Studio and and start with um, a clean sheet. So here's my uh, default text, and this is part of a scene, and my text is here. What I'm going to do is just going to clear out the scene completely and begin from scratch. So I'm going to hit go at the top of the scene hierarchy and hit backspace to delete. So now I have an empty scene. So down in the uh, right left hand side of the uh, the timeline window, I have the option to add objects into my scene. So the first object I'm going to add is some extruded text and that types with the default font. Here in the, uh, the text controls window, I can change the, the size and font of my text. So I'm going to go in here and choose a, a font. And nice bold black one here. And now I'm going to enter the first part of my uh, first part of my text. So uh, highlight the text and begin entering the first line of the text. So use the text size control here. I'm going to select the pair here and just adjust the kerning slightly just to get the Y in the right kerning relative to the T. So that's a good start. And using the on-screen widgets, you can select the different on-screen widgets here. I'm going to select the position widget. I'm just going to place this in position with the uh, the interactive control. Now I'm going to go over to the material styles tab and select from my material palette a suitable material for my text. So I just thought I'd addition a few here, and this one will be a good place to start. So now I want to create a background image for a background uh, placeholder for this text. So from the objects that I can add here, I'm going to add an extrusion object. You'll note that because I add it at this point in the hierarchy, it sits in front of the, the background text, which is not what I want. So I'm going to drag that down below so that it sits behind it. Now I'm going to go to the controls page for my rectangle, open that up. And you can see here that I can choose from different types of shapes, and primitives to build my object with. Here you can see the cropping value, so I'm going to uncrop that at the top and at the right and left. So basically, just building a, a simple background plate. Now I want to stylize this a little bit, so I'm going to adjust the corner size to give that a little bit of a, a rounded edge. Next up, I'm going to look at the uh, the color of that. So I'll go to my rectangle here. And once again, in the material styles, I'm going to go and select uh, some some different textures here. So, for example, brush textures with texture maps and bump maps and so on, and something like that. And now I'm going to adjust the the transparency of my text. So I'll go back to the controls here, and then just back that off a little bit. To make that semi-transparent. We're working with a fully um, immersive 3D environment here. So if I go into the, the scene settings and select from the lights tab, now my transform widget is controlling the light, which is lighting this scene. So I'll just position the light. And now I'm going to add the second line of text for my lower part of the, the graphic here. So once again, from the objects that I can add, this time I'm going to add 
some flat text and that's entered in the same font so i'm going to select that bring the size down a little bit choose a different font so this time i'll choose a a lighter weight size that down a little bit place it in position and enter my text and i'm going to set the tracking for this so that this justifies with my shape so just in a couple of steps i've created uh, a graphic i'm now able to apply this and store that as a still graphic over my background if i want to apply this to uh, another another shot then i can save it as a preset for quick loading later so i'm going to go here and open the preset options in the, the title studio effect window and hit save to save a preset and i can call this down 001 and now i'm going to move on to the next the next shot in the timeline and clear the effect off that now i'd like to add this as an animated effect now so once again i'm going to add the, the title studio plugin to the timeline and select effect mode and now go to load my presets so i can load my presets uh, by looking at a list but a more graphical way of doing this would be to launch the fx browser when i launch the fx browser and browse to my folder you can see the version that i've just created here and we can see these visual uh, thumbnails and a preview of any animation that's yet this is not yet animated but i want to add some animation to this so i'll select that i've got two options now i can apply that with its default uh settings that's the obviously the text that's i've already been entered or i can enter advanced mode which takes me back to the title studio ui where i can select any of my objects and go in there and type over okay so i'm just going to undo that because i don't want to do that and i'm going to hit apply so now that's applied statically to the background but i want to do a little bit of animation now so i'm going to launch into the title studio ui and I'm going to start organizing my objects so that I can animate them. So down below, I've got my main text, city, and the rectangle for the background. I'd like to fade those on as a single entity. So I'm going to shift select those. And from the container options here, I'm going to create a new 3D container. And now that 3D container contains both of those objects. So when I use the transform widget on that, I'm treating them globally. So now I just want to fade these on over time. So I'm going to go into the controls tab and now I'm going to begin animation. I can automatically enable animation here. I'm not a fan of that in any software application. I like to manually set keyframes so that I know where I've set them rather than have them randomly created uh, if I'm not paying attention. Before I start animating, I'm just going to uh, set up a very important setting for uh, for Title Studio. I'm going to go into the edit page and go to project settings and enable this very important parameter values hold option here. So hold parameter values means that when I set as keyframe, that keyframe is held in its uh, in its current state until I create another keyframe. Otherwise, it will try to re revert back to its unity state at the end of the timeline. So always remember to enable hold parameter values uh, to have a, a normal experience with animating uh, rather than um, having it return to unity. So now that I've done that, I'll look in the, uh, the uh, controls window for the position and uh, opacity of this shape, or this uh, overall container containing the shape and the, the background. 
And here I can set the opacity. Notice that's uh, only affecting the, the group of objects in the shape, uh, in the, in the uh, 3D container. This little guy here indicates that the, the values are not currently keyframed. They're just held at a constant value. If I tap here, this will open up uh, a drop-down menu of different types of keyframes that I can insert. So linear would have no acceleration between the keyframes, accelerate into a keyframe, decelerate into a keyframe, or ease in and out. So these are all the different types of keyframe interpolation that are available. I'm going to select a linear keyframe, and that's now represented by a diagonal line. And there is now a keyframe set at this frame. I can't see it because it's underneath the, uh, the trim tool here. But if I go previous keyframe, it'll navigate back to it. Then I'm going to move a little forward in time and I'm going to set another keyframe here just by adjusting the value and in the controls window select another linear keyframe here and now you can see the little uh, round keyframe indicator so the opacity is the same at the beginning and at the point where I've set the keyframe. So I'm going to navigate back to the first keyframe and reduce the opacity to zero. Now when I move the CTI through the timeline, the transparency for the, the 3D container interpolates between the two values set at the keyframes. So now I want to animate on the, the second line of text here. So I'll select that and twirl that open to look at some of the transformation controls for the text itself. Now I want to animate the tracking over time. So as before, I'm going to navigate back just after the beginning of the shot. And I'm going to set a keyframe, once again a linear keyframe for the tracking here. Note the tracking is zero. I'll make a mental note of that because I'll need to restore that at a later frame. So now I'm just going to drag in the window to set the tracking so that the, uh, the letters appear off the screen. And I'll now navigate to the keyframe on the previous layer, and that synchronizes uh, my position in the timeline. I can now set another keyframe for my Tracking parameter, once again, a linear keyframe, and then to zero to return that to unity. So as I drag the CTI through the timeline, you can see that I've now animated my graphic on. I'll hit apply, and that's now applied to the segment in my timeline. So basically, starting from scratch, it's very quick and easy to create graphics and animate graphics using uh, the tools in Title Studio. There are a wide variety of presets available. So I'm going to store this preset and place it in my folder and clear out my effects from the existing layers and begin again by examining the preset browser. So the effects browser and now we'll take a look at some of the many custom presets that are pres provided as a part of the, the installation. So these are organized into categories so here we have type on text, here we have lower thirds. As you can see in the, the preview window, as I scrub, this gives me an interactive preview of how that effect would look. There are a great many presets, many hundreds of presets, too many to go into detail with at the moment, but. Uh, if you're interested in examining them, download a trial and uh, you can check out all of the, uh, the pre-installed presets 
with all of the uh, the new effects and uh, shaders and deformers and uh, various tools that are available. I'm going to go back to my own folder here and I'm going to load the initial preset for my lower third graphic here. But first of all, I'm going to exit from here and I'm just going to trim my timeline down a little bit. So I choose my trim tool in the Avid timeline and with the trim tool enabled, I'll just trim that down to six seconds. So now I've got a six second segment. I'll once again apply Title Studio, go to the Effect tool, show the Effects browser, load my preset, and jump into Advanced mode. So here you can see the, the animation which applies to this, this shot. Basically, the lower third title bar opens up and the text animates on. And this happens in just over one second. And the animation off also happens in just over one second. If I apply that, as I scrub through the timeline, because this is tied to the duration of the clip, this will be elastic. So when I make a trim, this will be extended. So if I enable the trim tool once again and trim to extend the duration, so effectively double the length of that animation. And now I'm going to launch back into the, the Title Studio UI. We see now that the animation is taking longer, approximately twice as long. So sometimes this is desirable, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we'd like to set the animation to be a specific duration. So this is what rigid runs are for. So I'm going to apply that. I'm going to trim back to my original timing of around six seconds. Return to the Title Studio UI. And create a rigid run. So now my animation is elastic. That's because of the whole of the timeline is uh, filled in light gray here. So that indicates that this is elastic. So as I trim in, in Avid, so that will affect the duration of my animation. I want to fix this at uh, a, a fixed uh, duration of around one second. So what I'm going to do here is move my, my CTI to the start of the shot and Add rigid run. What a rigid run does is uh, fixes the duration within the window shown as dark gray here. So everything that happens here will be fixed to one second. If I go down here and to the end of the timeline and once again add another rigid run for the end timing. and apply that. Now when I trim to extend the length of my, my shot and once again jump into the, the Title Studio UI for this segment, we see now that the, the animation is fixed at the duration of just over one second and the center section is extended and the animate off also lasts one second. So Depending on whether you add rigid runs in your timeline, you can allow your animations to be dictated by the duration of the, the trim on the segment that it's applied to, or you can set precise timings as required. I'm going to hit that, apply, and then just preview the, uh, the effect with the rigid run. So moving on to the next example, I'll return to my bins here. And we'll take a look at working with some, some more esoteric effects. So here we've got a background plate of uh, a club. 
and uh, I'd like to add some graphics to that. So in my effect bin, I've got my Title Studio preset here. It's a quick and easy way to access your effects uh, without having to go and browse them in the effect palette. So I'm going to drop that on my adjustment layer here and launch into the Title Studio UI. And once again, I'm going to clear out the uh, existing preset and add a new flat text operator. So now with a flat text operator, I can obviously set the, the font as required. And I'm going to go and take a look for the, uh, the font that I want to use. Enter my text. And go to the, the color tab in the text editor and choose a, a suitably garish color for my text. And I return back to the text options and increase the size of my text. So now I'd like to add a little bit of stylized look to the text. And this is where the shaders come in. So there are different types of shaders, there are spatial shaders, which actually deform the geometry of the text, and image processors. So I'm going to add a, a glow edge effect. And if I go to the controls for the glow edge effect, now I can play with the settings. So I'm going to go in here and choose the output color. That, uh, a little bit more, a little bit more like my graphic, and I'm going to increase the intensity of it, something like that. And I want to animate this, so I'm going to go a little bit further down the timeline, and I'm going to set a keyframe for intensity. And as I move through the timeline with automatic keyframing enabled this time. I can add keyframes as I go, just to make that kind of pulse a little bit. So something like that. I'll go to this one, make it a little bit darker. And we'll move forward and make it a little bit more intense on this frame. So I'm going to set another keyframe here. Note that where it's highlighted in red, I'm actually adjusting that frame. What I actually want to do is move my CTI to a different frame and then set another keyframe here. So now it's sort of pulsing. And I want to now add a spatial deformer. So once again, with my text layer enabled, I'll go to my shaders and take a look at the deformers. So this time I'm going to add the pulse deformer. And this warps it around a kind of polar spherical area. I'm going to turn off my auto animate here because I don't want to create keyframes as I move through. I want to create them explicitly. And there are different uh, modes uh, or uh, for the uh, for the animation, um, different kind of pulses or whatever. What I want to do this. Uh, with this example is do it manually. So I'm going to set that on pause so I can set that um, by setting keyframes. So here the amplitude value is the intensity of the effect. So at the first frame, I'm going to set this to the maximum so that it's sort of exploded out of the frame and add a linear keyframe as before. Now I'm going to move back to the point at which I want to resolve the animation, add another linear keyframe and set the amplitude to zero. So now that will interpolate between those two states. Now I want to add some additional text. So I'm going to go to my scene, go to the top of the hierarchy and add some flat text this time. And as before, I want to choose another font. 
So I'll go and search for the, the font that I want. Select my text. Select my text color. And choose the font. So in the text window, I'll pick a font. So there's my font for my foreground text. Now I'm going to enter that. So select the color. Select the size. And use the on-screen widget to set the position. Let's get that suitably aligned. Now I'm going to set the, the kerning so that that aligns with the edge of my, my background text. So once again, set the, the tracking so that's aligned. Now I want the text to, to reveal over time. So if I go to the, the controls for the text, There are many different options that I can apply, uh, select to adjust for the, the text. What I want to do here is go to the type on parameter and I can adjust the type on behavior of the text as it reveals over time. So there's only one keyframe for this and then all of the various parameters uh, will be cycled through those keyframes to reveal the text over time. So I want to begin my animation around about here. So I'm gonna once again set a linear keyframe for the type on value and set that to zero. Now moving forward in time, I'll set another keyframe for the type on value and reveal that. So now this is just a, a regular type on behavior, but I can change the, uh, the parameters that animate as part of the type on. So what I'm gonna do here is change the scale X and scale Y parameters so that the, the text not only types on, but expands over time. And if I hit apply and play that back in the AVID timeline, we can see the end result. So here I'm just using a couple of the spatial modifiers or single spatial modifier and the edge glow effect which is a kind of a pixel shader uh, to give us a lighting effect in the next example we're going to take a look at uh, working with 3d text uh, or 3d objects so in this example i've done another version of this but this time i've added a textured sphere texture map with the the live action on the background we'll take a look a bit later at how we can add 3d objects and even 3d models from uh, cgi applications into our compositions but before we do we're going to take a look at another powerful tool for motion graphics in uh, continuum which is the pan and zoom effect so here's my background plate um, i'm going to go to the effects palette to the continuum perspective group and add bcc pan and zoom and it's applied with its default setting which is basically just animating over time to change the size of my foreground layer Obviously, if I go a lot bigger with my foreground layer, you can see that that can get a little bit uh, ragged, but it's only HD scaling up inside an HD window, inside an HD canvas. What I want to do really is add a high resolution image 
and perform a virtual rostrum move. So I'll twirl open the source options for the BCC pan and zoom filter and select an external file as my source image. Now I'll click the external file browser and browse to the folder containing some high res images. So if I hit open on this one, this is a 12K resolution image, which I grabbed from Google Earth of London. So there's the default move being applied here. So I'd like to edit that to go in a little bit closer. So we're going to take a look at the different animation modes. So the default workflow is the AB auto animation workflow. This basically interpolates from state A to state B over the duration of the clip. Very simple and straightforward type of animation. If I twirl open the transforms group and go to the end of the animation where I'm at position B and change the, the, uh, the B scale, you'll see now that I've zoomed in closer. This is OK, but uh, if I want to have more in, uh, gestural visual, visual, um, uh, interaction with this, I, I have a preview mode that will enable me to work a little bit more interactively. So when I enable preview mode, depending on which setup I preview, I'll get a window indicating the area for each of the positions A and B. So setup A is Unity zoomed out. Here you can see the, the resolution of the file, incidentally, just uh, 12, it's a little bit around about 12K. Um, so I'm going to go to setup B and with the on-screen widget, I'm going to pick up the, the positioner and drag that to where I want to begin animating or end, end my animation. And you see now in the preview window at the top right, you can see a preview of the animation. If I switch, switch back to out of preview mode, now the animation is applied. At the moment, I'm working in proxy mode in Avid, uh, which is handy if you want to get a bit better in interactivity at high resolution. Um, there's also uh, a draft mode enabled within the tool, which can give you better interactivity. So what I'm going to do here is switch up to full res mode and zoom right in. And you can see that's still very sharp. I toggle draft mode. That will uh, do a little bit less anti-aliasing and give me a bit more interactivity while I'm editing. So that's the simple AB mode. If I want to do something a little bit more finessed, the second mode for animation is the completion, AB completion workflow. So I'm going to select AB completion mode. And now when I scrub the timeline, nothing happens. That's because I need to set keyframes for the percentage of the completion of the transition between position A and position B. Now, when I'm in AB completion mode, there's an animation group to twirl open. So I'll twirl that, twirl that open, and now I can set the completion amount, beginning of the transition, the end of the transition. So if I go to the AVID timeline and create a keyframe. That's my initial keyframe to where at the start of the shot where I want to begin the animation. Now I'm going to go a little way through and set another keyframe and set the completion to its fullest. So now between those two keyframes, I zoom in and then it remains static. If I want to now pull out again, I'll set another keyframe and then go to the end and set a final keyframe and set the completion back to Unity again. So we zoom in, hold, 
and then zoom out. The final mode uh, that we're going to explore for animating pan and zoom is the manual mode. So if I open up the transform A group, now I'm setting keyframes for the animation manually. I'm just going to remove the existing keyframes. So this is like full uh, manual animation. So if I open up the transforms, once again, open up the, uh, the preview window and take a look at transform B. So there's transform B. So I want to begin my animation here. And I'm going to zoom right in tight and set a keyframe. And now I'm going to simulate the motion of someone driving around the streets of London. So something like that. And you'll notice that each time I set a keyframe, the software interpolates between it, as you'd expect. And I'm going to set my end keyframe right about here and using the option key you can move the keyframes around in the avid timeline so option drag so this is going to be my final position where i i hold the animation at the end so just scrub through that and we can see the preview on the top right and now i'll come out of preview mode and scrub through and you can see it's kind of a helicopter's eye view of uh, the streets there. So the next thing I want to do is uh, is add the graphics. So I'm going to go Command Y uh, on the keyboard there, or Control Y on Windows, and I'm going to add an adjustment layer. And then I'm going to go to my Effect Bin where I've stored my Title Studio quick preset here. Drag that in, make sure that V2 only is selected. And I'm going to come in the end where the animation resolves here and perform a cut on that layer. So add an edit here. And I'm going to remove the, the first part of that. So I want to ins insert my, my text here. So I've got a preset for that. So I'm going to go up to the uh, Effect Editor, launch the Effects Browser, and in here, I've got my, my graphic, and I'm going to apply that, and scrub through the timeline. So this is the, the helicopter following the car chase, and here's the, the graphic revealing the theory. If I go to the right layer, that is, uh, there's the, the graphic revealing where the suspect was apprehended. Okay, so it's an example of uh, quick generating a quick uh, information graphic for broadcast news. Once again, we'll go back to the sequence window. We'll look at something um, a bit more esoteric for creating. Uh, a motion graphic title. So, as before, I've uh, I've done a an animation on uh, a high resolution antique map here using the pan and zoom tool. If I go to that layer, go to the effect editor, and open up the pan and zoom controls, we can see just a simple static move. But uh, there's more to pan and zoom than that. So what I'm going to do here is enable 3D mode. So we can do a, a full perspective 3D move. So if I go in here and adjust the spin value at my first keyframe, my tumble value. So now we're kind of doing a, like a 3D rostrum move on this. 
And we can also add additional effects like motion blur to smooth the motion. I'm just going to remove that because I don't need it. I want to keep it nice and sharp. Other effects such as vignetting, which will open the vignette window. You know, adjust the radius. We can apply defocus as part of the vignette effect and fill with a color. Okay. We can also change the transfer mode. So a regular compositing mode, if I increase the blur amount, so that's kind of like has a kind of a effect of defocusing. Or if I change this to subtract inverse, then this uh, darkens the, the darker colors at the edges as well as defocusing them for more kind of stylized look. So there's my move on my virtual rostrum there. Now I want to add some text. So if I go to my upper layer and once again add from my effects bin my Title Studio preset, I'm going to load my preset. And this is kind of boring and flat at the moment. I want to bring this to life and give it a bit of depth. So I'm going to launch into the Title Studio UI and take a look at uh, working with 3D objects. As we've seen before, this is an immersive 3D environment. If I switch to the uh, perspective view, you can see I'm moving the light around in 3D space. It's like a little simple 3D modeling world in here. And if we want to import 3D models, we can. We'll see how we can do that later. But what I want to do here is take my text and extrude it to give it a bit of depth. So I'm going to select my, my text here, go to the extrusion parameters, and turn up the extrusion to make that deeper. So I'll set the depth. I don't want it too deep, just, just deep enough so that we can see the edges. And I can also add a bevel to that. Can make that a straight bevel, or what I'm going to do here is make that a convex bevel to give that a little bit of a rounded edge. So that's starting to look a little bit a little bit more appealing, but now I want to add a material. So if I go to my material styles here and look at my metallic textures, with my text selected here, I can audition various preset textures that are supplied. I could also build my own if I, if I so wish. What I'm gonna do here is go to the one that I wanna apply, which is kind of a texture map and a bump map. So if I go up to the top of the scene settings here, and whoop, I just created a duplicate of that unintentionally. I went to the scene settings and go to the lighting controls. Now you can see as I move my light around that uh, interacts with the bump map on the text. So far, so good. If I hit apply, now I have something with a little bit more depth. So to add yet more depth, I want to use some uh, some other tools that are new to Continuum 2020 that allow us to work within the, the AVID timeline to add shade and reflections to our compositions. So these are found in the BCC Stylize group, and these are BCC Reflection and BCC Cast Shadow. I want to add this on top of the, uh, the text effect. So if I were to drag that onto this adjustment layer, that would replace the text effect. I don't want to do that. I want to add that to the effect stack. So I'm going to twirl title studio closed and I'm going to option drag or alt drag in the case of windows to add the cast shadow effect above my title studio effect. Now at this point, 
it's applying the cast shadow effect to the entire layer. So if I move the entire layer, you can see where the shadow is being cast, but that's not what I want to do. I want to apply it to only the title studio layer through its map. So if I go down to the title studio layer and say the background is none, now BCC cast shadow is being applied to the mat for the title studio layer. So let's take a, a closer look at some of the parameters in BCC cast shadow. I'll twirl open the light group and select the color picker for the shadow color. I'm going to set this to, to black to get a nice strong shadow. Next up, I'm going to change the position of the light. So I'll use the, the on screen control. So now the light is being cast behind my object. Now I can adjust the softness of the shadow and the aspect of the softness. And as I move my light around, you'll see that interact. At this point, it's not really, the shadow plane isn't really aligned with the perspective of my background move. So we'll take a, a look at the preview modes here. If I twirl open preview mode to show the shadow on the grid, now we can see the shadow plane and it's clearly not aligned with the perspective of the background. So I'm gonna close the light group, twirl open the shadow plane group, and now mess a little bit with the orientation, the shadow plane. So this is more in keeping with the perspective of the background. Something like that. Auto fit shadow allows me to move the shadow independently of my foreground plane. The image plane, on the other hand, allows me to adjust the overall orientation of the composition. So if I go back to no preview mode, and if I want to change the angle slightly, then I can twirl open the image plane and change the rotation and alignment of the whole composition. Let's give that a bit of a slightly skew look to that. If I want to reveal my text, I'm going to go, go back and take a look at some of the uh, some of the wipe shaders in Title Studio. So I'm done creating my shadow. I'll twirl open Title Studio again and jump into the UI for Title Studio. Now I'll select my my first line of text and add a shader. Once again, I'll add an image processing effect and I'm going to choose the, the burnt film operator. The burnt film operator kind of does a stylized wipe to simulate film burnout and that's filled with a gradient of colors. So that default red for the highlight color is a little bit garish. So I'm going to go and use the color picker to pick a color off of the actual text itself. And that should sit back a little bit more comfortably. So unfortunately, Avid has chosen to close. So now we're back in and we'll take a look at uh, the example that I pre pre prepared earlier. So we'll go back to my bins here and back into my sequences. And if we jump in here, so here's kind of where I was, and what I was planning to do before uh, Avid uh, closed was to use the, the film wipe tool to reveal the foreground text, and I also used uh, the erode tool to reveal 
the 3D text. If I just jump in there and take a look at the, the settings. So select my smart tool, select my layer, and jump into the title Studio UI. And select my, my foreground layer. So there I was using the shader um, film wipe. If we go there, you can see that. So there's the burnt film wipe. And then I've also used the erosion shader to reveal the, the metallic text there. So the last example, we're just going to take a look at the second new tool in Continuum 2020, which is the BCC reflection tool. So I've done a similar kind of move here reveal my text, I'd like to reflect this on the surface of the water. So once again, from the effect palette, from the Continuum Stylized group, I'm gonna add BCC reflection. Uh, I want to hold Option Drag to make sure that this is added below. As before, it's reflecting the entire layer. So if I go to Title Studio and say background is none, then it just reflects the Title Studio layer. So let's twirl Title Studio close and take a look at BCC reflection. Very similar workflow to um, BCC cast shadow. There's an image plane and a plane for the reflection. So if I twirl open the uh, reflection plane controls and adjust the XY position, the reflection as you can see i can set the uh, position of the reflection and so on what i want to do here is uh, play a little bit with the the width just to add a little bit of kind of perspective to that now i'm going to go into the reflection style settings where i can set the softness or defocus of the reflection and the fade as the reflection kind of fades off into the distance. I'm also going to set the overall opacity of the reflection to make that a little bit transparent. And because it's being reflected on water, it would be nice if it rippled. So uh, take a look at the ripple parameter. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so that we can see a bit more closely. So I'll just put that up against the, the bottom of the, the text there and open up the ripple parameter. What I'll do is I'll put that behind. So if I go into the image plane and say show under, now the, the text is, is sitting on top. And I'm going to set the Y point to a precise value and so minus 35 might do it for us, something like that, maybe less, uh, minus 32, oh, not 53, something like that. So minus 32, that'll probably do it for us. And now I want to add some ripples. So I'll just go in a little bit closer and That's more like it. Um, and take a look at the ripple parameter and reflection style. So if we go down to the ripple amount, now I can turn up the intensity of the rippling. And change the speed of the ripple and the scale in X and Y. Now you can see that's... Uh, rippling in sympathy with the the water there the last little thing i i planned to add to this was um a little bit of uh of 3d content from um from 3d studio so i'm going to jump into my title studio tool here launch the ui 
and here's my uh, my composition and from things that I can add I can also choose 3d models so I'll open uh, the browser go to my models folder drop in a, a 3d model move that down to the bottom of the hierarchy move it back as you can see it's reacting to the light quite nicely move that into position choose a material style for it something like that and once again animate that on so that uh, that reveals so i'll get my controls for that layer and set a keyframe for the y rotation set that to 90 degrees Go a little bit further in time and set another keyframe to zero so that, that spins on and apply that and now we have the, uh, the logo revealing so now i'll need to just make a little tweak to my reflection plane because uh, we've added some new content into that so i'll take my reflection plane and set that to auto fit and scroll through to preview my finished animation which concludes my presentation for today i'd like to thank you all for watching and uh, i hope that uh, you'll take the opportunity to enjoy being creative with these uh, these tools in continuum 2020 and uh, my colleagues are standing by if you have any questions thanks a lot for watching